Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to session 8 of our training and development course. Today in this session, we will explore the importance of diversity and inclusion. We will talk about how to design and implement the effective training program specifically related to diversity. And also, we will try to work on some tips to foster an inclusive training environment. So let us get started. We will start with the definitions of diversity and inclusion. So diversity includes the multitude of differences that exist within the organization. So within an organization there are multiple differences that exist. They may exist pertaining to race, ethnicity, gender, age, sexual orientation, socio-economic status physical abilities, religious beliefs and educational background and it acknowledges the unique perspective, experiences and identities individuals bring to the table. In contrast, when we talk about inclusion, it refers to the deliberate efforts to create an environment which accommodates everyone, where everyone feels valued, respected and empowered to contribute fully towards the organizational goal. It involves actively engaging with diversity, fostering a sense of belongingness and ensuring that all voices are heard and considered. So inclusion goes beyond mere tolerance or acceptance. It requires proactive measures to dismantle barriers and create opportunities for equitable participation and advancements of all individuals. Next we move to some of the benefits of diversity and inclusion. There are multiple benefits of having diverse workforce in the organization and cultivating an inclusive culture where everyone feel valued, everyone feel hurt and everyone has that feeling of belongingness towards the organization. So what are the benefits bestowed upon by including uh, by uh, you know incorporating an inclusive culture? and having diverse uh, individuals working in the organization. The very first point is diversity fosters innovation by bringing together individuals with diverse perspectives. So when people come from diverse perspectives, people come from diverse backgrounds in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, religious groups, skills, backgrounds, uh, it can definitely lead to creative problem solving and the development of innovative solutions. So there are multiple researches which have been conducted in this context and they claim that diversity is something that fosters innovation or we may say diversity is directly related with innovation. Secondly, diverse teams are better equipped and understand and serve a diverse customer base leading to ultimate improved customer satisfaction and loyalty. So if we have a diverse customer uh, base in the organization, uh, the diverse workforce is able to cater to the requirement of the diverse customer base also and it is able to better provide some kind of customer satisfaction to them and also the loyalty can be generated out of it. Thirdly, when we talk about an inclusive work environment. Uh, this kind of environment promotes employee satisfaction and retention because everyone feels valued, everyone feels uh, that feeling of belongingness is there in everyone, everyone feels that they are being heard. So the employee satisfaction increases like anything and the employee retention can also be attained. So if we are trying to create an inclusive work environment then certainly the employee satisfaction and retention can be improved to a large extent. Uh, and how does it happen? It ha happens by ensuring that all employees feel valued, respected and supported in their contribution. 
Moreover, diversity and inclusion have been linked to enhanced organizational performance, enhanced increased uh, profitability and definitely greater resilience in the face of change and adversity. So, what are the various barriers? What are the things that hinder diversity and inclusion? What are the various factors which can contribute towards, uh, you know, creating a hindrance uh, for diversity and inclusion in the workplaces? So, despite the compelling business cases for diversity and inclusion, numerous barriers persist that hinder the growth and progress in this area. Now, we have multiple biases that we are going to talk about. We have unconscious bias or automatic association of stereotypes or attitude with particular groups which can lead to further unfair treatment, decision making in hiring, promotion, recruitment, selection, performance evaluation, so on and so forth. So, discrimination whether overt or subtle can create a hostile work environment and it gets very difficult for individuals to accommodate themselves in such kind of environment which is very hostile and definitely impacts their employee engagement level, their customer satisfaction level and ultimately the productivity of the entire organization is also hampered as a consequence to such kind of issues. Uh, moreover, the lack of representation of certain groups in the leadership positions and decision making roles perpetuates inequities and reinforces existing power structures. So, these barriers not only undermine organizational effectiveness, but also contribute to employee dissatisfaction, higher employee turnover and disengagement among employees, which further aggravates like anything towards, you know, which further aggregates and hinder the progress of the organization and definitely it impacts the organizational success to a large extent. So, addressing these barriers is a must and we must try our level best to bring about some such kind of policies in the organization which are inclusive, which accommodate everyone, which, uh, you know, uh, which hold the individuals and organization accountable for their actions. Now, we move to uh, some of the key components for effective diversity. Now, when we talk about key components of uh, effective diversity training, the very first thing here is the education on bias awareness. So, effective diversity training should start by raising awareness of unconscious biases that can influence attitudes, behaviors and decision making. So, participants should learn to recognize their own biases and understand how they can impact their interactions and outcomes in the workplace. Next is cultural competence. So, training programs should provide participants with the knowledge and skill needed to navigate diverse cultural landscapes sensitively and effectively. So, some kind of basic training is required to be given in context of the cultural competence. So, this includes understanding the different cultural norms values, communication styles and perspective to foster cross-cultural understanding and collaboration. Let me give you an example in this context. So, if you are operating in a business uh, in some other part of the globe, so certainly you need to know the norms of that country and you also need to know the kind of people who you would be working with. You need to understand their communication styles to work better and to serve them better. You need to understand the cultural norms, the values and also some kind of perspectives to foster a very, very uh, inclusive work culture within the organization so that the organizational goals and objectives are achieved. Then we have inclusive leadership. This is another component of effective diversity training and uh, inclusive leadership here would mean effective diversity training should empower leaders and managers to champion diversity and inclusion within their teams and organization and involves cultivating skills such as active listening skills, empathy and inclusive communication as well as fostering an inclusive work culture through equitable policies and practices. So, we need to have all these things in place in order to create a culture, a culture full of diversity inclusion and inclusive environment also. Now, uh, we move to tailoring the training programs to organizational needs. When we talk about training the uh, tailoring the programs uh, according to the organizational need, we need to recognize that each organization has its own unique culture. 
challenges and opportunities concerning diversity. So, definitely uh, we need to celebrate the diversity in the culture that uh, is brought because definitely direct diversity and inclusion is directly linked with innovation and uh, innovation would certainly be a competitive edge in order to achieve the success for any organization. So, whenever we are thinking on the lines of tailoring the training program, it, it, it should always be tailored according to the organizational need and the very first thing which comes into picture here is recognizing the, uh, that each organization has its own set of norms, values, culture, challenges and opportunity uh, concerning the diversity and inclusion. Then we need to carry a thorough need analysis. So, here understanding the needs of uh, giving the training to the individual is a must. We need to understand that what are the needs of training. So, if the challenges uh, differ in various organization, of course, the needs of the organization would also be different with uh, reference to the diversity and inclusion training that we want to bring in. So, we need to conduct a thorough need assessment to identify the specific areas of improvement and tailor the, con uh, you know, tailor the uh, training program, training content and delivery methods accordingly. Uh, so, everything has to be in line with the needs of the organization. So, it is a must. Then incorporating feedback from employees and stakeholders to, to ensure the training programs address relevant issues and also they resonate with the participants. So, constructive feedback has its own role to play. Every now and then the organization should think of and think on the lines of collecting the constructive feedback from the appropriate stakeholders. So, that the issues pertaining to diversity and providing an inclusive work environment within the organization is met and we are able to uh, put those feedbacks and the inputs that we have received in the feedback in our training program. And, uh, we have to ensure that the training programs very well address the relevant issues and resonate with the participants. Now, let us talk about some of the best practices which can be used for designing the diverse training programs. The very first one here is engaging and interactive sessions. So, the training sessions have to be designed in such a fashion that they look very interactive. They are very engaging and participatory in nature to facilitate active learning and meaningful dialogue. So, basically we should incorporate more of group discussions, more of role plays and interactive exercises to ensure self reflection and peer learning. So, how can it be fostered? It can only be fostered if we are trying to include more of group discussions, more of role playing ex exercises, more of simulation exercises interactive exercises to uh, bring everybody together and to involve them in more of team exercises so that uh, they all come together and understand each other really well. So, the training uh, programs which we are designing for uh, ensuring that uh, we are accommodating the diversity in the organization have to be very very inclusive and they have to be very engaging and interactive also. Next is uh, real life examples and case studies. So, uh, in the previous uh, lectures, in the previous sessions, we addressed these issues related to uh, real life examples and case studies. So, the best of the case studies can be uh, taught to the people and some of the case studies which uh, are basically about the real life situations, the real life examples need to be taught to the people to illustrate certain concepts and practices related to diversity. So, drawing from diverse experiences and perspectives helps participants to uh, relate more to the material and they are then able to understand its relevance uh, to their own work and interactions. Then there are several experiential learning exercises. So, these experiential learning exercises can be uh, taken up and uh, they can definitely contribute towards designing diverse uh, training programs. We should try to have more of simulation based exercises, more of uh, scenario based exercises should be there, more of immersive experiences should be there. These days many of the organizations are even incorporating the idea of virtual uh, 
reality, augmented reality, then they are trying to create such some kind of experiential uh, learning for the people in terms of uh, giving them good amount of uh, guesstimates to make them brainstorm at a particular uh, point of time. So, this is about you know your experiential learning activities. So, now we move to overcoming resistance and building support. Uh, when, it, when it comes to overcoming the resistance and building support, there are few things that we have to take care of. Number one is leadership involvement. In the organization, to secure the visible support and endorsement from the organizational leaders to dem demonstrate a commitment to diversity and inclusion is a must. So, we need to encourage the leaders to actively participate in training sessions share their personal experiences as to how the you know how the di diversity brings a lot of value to the organization they need to be encouraged to share their personal experiences and also the role model inclusive be behavior needs to be there then it's about demonstra uh, demonstrating the impact so, we have to track and measure the impact of diversity training initiatives. We have several methods and mechanisms to track and measure the impact of diversity training initiatives. We may make, make use of different methods like for example, for evaluation the impact of diversity training methods, we may go for some kind of post and sorry pre and post. training evaluation. We may even go for some kind of behavioral testing of an individual post the training was imparted. Then we can also uh, track and measure the impact of diversity training initiatives on organizational culture as to how did diversity training contribute to bringing a better culture to the organizations. Then we may even go for some kind of uh, testing of employee attitude. So, we have so many standardized tests available which are capable enough to understand the employee activities and employee attitudes. Similarly, we have several standardized tests pertaining to diversity and inclusion. The reliability and validity of those tests can be tested and then they are good to go, then we may ask our employees to go for those kinds of tests, so that we are able to understand the essence of giving the training to the people. So, it, it is assumed that when you are giving the training related to diversity to the people, they would definitely bring some kind of outcomes in form of better productivity, in terms of lower absenteeism in terms of lower accommodation etc sorry higher accommodation etc so it's important for us to take care of these things and we need to finally figure out the impact of such trainings on the people then we can even go for return on investment testing as in the amount which was uh, spent towards training initiatives was it worth or not or did it actually bring some kind of return on investment or not was there any kind of return on expectations or not? So, several methods that we dealt with to uh, evaluate the training mechanisms in the previous lectures including the CIPP model, the CIRO model wherein C stands for context, I for input, R for reaction and uh, O for output or outcome. Similarly, CIRO method, CIPP method, uh, Brinker-Hoff's method then uh, several questionnaires, surveys, uh, longitudinal tests, then surveys can be used, the pre and post tests can be used, several quantitative methods can be used, so that we can get some kind of data driven insights to understanding diversity and uh, the effect of diversity training on the organization as a whole. Then providing regular updates and progress reports to the stakeholders to demonstrate the value of DNI efforts and sustain momentum for change. So, these regular updates have to be provided 
if they are provided with regular updates and every now and then we are involving the employees of the organization, the trainees of the organization in some of the other activities which relates to diversity and inclusion and they are made to participate in those activities, then the essence of diversity and inclusion will be percolated deep inside the uh, employees and the trainees and they would certainly be benefited out of this. So, the progress reports have to be shared, the regular updates have to be shared so that we are able to keep a track of the progress of diversity and inclusion training. Otherwise, the amount spent on diversity and inclusion training would go into vain. So, a lot of support from the leadership, a lot of uh, reinforce from re re uh, inform in reinforcement at um, all levels by the leadership demonstrating impact and providing regular updates about the uh, progress is an important thing to address. Now, when it comes to fostering an inclusive training environment, we need to understand why is it important. Fostering an inclusive environment is very, very important because it is essential for ensuring that all participants feel proud, they feel valued, they also feel respected and they feel empowered to voice their opinions. They feel empowered to engage fully in the learning process. So, therefore, this kind of training assumes a lot of significance. Such kind of environment is supposed to be developed in the organization. Moreover, openness, the culture of openness has to be there in the organization. The, the culture of confrontation has to be there in the organization, the culture of trust has to be there in the organization, the culture of autonomy has to be given to the individuals to work within their uh, limits. I mean, if we are going for more of micromanagement and uh, we are not taking care of the autonomy of the individuals and we are not accommodating our inclusive, div uh, inclusive uh, I mean, we are not accommodating the diverse workforce and we are not creating a uh, inclusive kind of work environment for the people, then it would not be possible to generate 100 percent uh, output as expected. So, we need to put in a lot of efforts to create this inclusive working environment. A lot of effort goes in terms of training, in terms of positive reinforcement in the organization and also uh, you know boosting the morale of the people and keeping them motivated to value it every now and then. Uh, now, there are few things that we will be talking about. Uh, the inclusive working environment and the very first important aspect of inclusive work environment is creating a psychological safety. Now, what is a psychological safety? Psychological safety is the foundation of an inclusive working environment. It is about creating an environment, creating a climate within the organization where participants feel safe to express their thoughts. They are free to open up on their ideas. They are free to open up on their concerns without fear of judgment or reprisal. So, facilitators should establish grounds that promote respect, confidentiality and open communication at the same time. We need to you know encourage our participants to actively listen to things, show some kind of empathy towards each other, suspend the judgment and also address any disrespectful behavior promptly and constructively to maintain a supportive learning environment. So, supportive learning environment is the key and we need to be very, very particular about creating this supportive work environment within the organization. So, I will just uh, put an example here in this context. One of the training which can be uh, conducted uh, in context of inclusivity and diversity can have an element of emotional intelligence also. So, when it comes to emotional intelligence, if the individuals would have this sense of emotional intelligence and uh, by taking the training, if their emotional intelligence level is raised, then certainly it can prove to be very, very productive for the organization. Now, how would it happen and what all are the things that need to be included in it? Like for example, we may have some kind of uh, sessions for people specifically related to self-awareness. Once they are very well aware of what is self-awareness, they are able to dig uh, deeper into what they are 
by means of some kind of psychometric assessments, by means of some kind of uh, some kind of uh, standardized tests, they and uh, by means of conducting some kind of activities like, for example, uh, the strengths, weakness, opportunity, uh, threat analysis of the individuals, we can get to know about the self-awareness levels. There can be n number of interventions which can be used by the organizations to create this kind of self-awareness tests for the people. And then another thing which could be done in context of it could be including the element of self-regulation. So, once people are aware of what they are doing and what they are, they should also know about the self-regulation, which would mean they should know about how to regulate their behavior. If some trigger comes, how should they address it? If somebody comes in front of them from an, you know, from a diverse kind of culture, how to, how to address that individual. So, such kind of trainings need to be given to the individual, so that nobody feels hurt and uh, nobody feels disrespectful in the conduct of the individuals. Then there has to be something, some element related to motivation also. People have to be sufficiently motivated to take up the tasks uh, which are given to them in the organization. They need to be uh, given some kind of training on social skills also. So, if you are incorporating the element of social skills in the training program and you are actually putting in intended efforts to ensure that the social skills of the individuals are boosted to a large extent, it gets very easy for the organization to create that inclusive culture then because people know how to deal with what kind of people and uh, people also get to know about the fact that it is not that you are always right. It can be the other way around also, the other person might also be right. So, always uh, bearing this thought in mind that I am okay and other person is also okay is something that we need to really look at. So, we, ha we all have uh, this kind of uh, thing, we all in the course of uh, life, you know, we all have some kind of uh, uh, life positions, we all develop our all, all life positions. At times we think that, uh, I mean there are four things for example, I will just let you know about it. There can be five, four such situations which might happen in which an individual might think that I am okay, you are not okay. Then the second aspect could be I am not okay, you are not okay. Then there can be third situation wherein an individual might feel I am not okay, you are okay. And fourth situation can be I am okay and I am, I mean you are also okay. So, the, these kinds of different kinds of situations that an individual can end up in and uh, in the course of growing up we tend to you know develop one or the other uh, thing either we start thinking that I am always right, but the other person is not right or we start thinking that I am not okay the other person because there is certain level of disbelief in ourselves. So, we start thinking that I am not okay the other person is always right. It might be the thing that the individual is thinking that I am not okay, whatever I am doing is not okay, but then other person is perfectly okay. Then there can be situation and in which he might think that I am also okay and you are also okay. So, the uh, you know inclusive leadership would come, the inclusive work environment would come when we start believing in this one. That is I am okay, you are okay, where an individual thinks that I am whatever I am putting forward is fine and whatever the other individual is also coming up with is also fine. So, this is something called as accommodative work culture. So, we need to have this kind of accommodative work culture wherein we have belief in ourselves and we also have a belief in the other individuals. So, if we try to create this kind of culture within the organization, ultimately the psychological safety of an individual uh, working in the organization can be improved to a large extent. So, uh, we need to create such kind of environment where people feel safe, they do not feel hostile, they are encouraged to respect each other, they are encouraged to you know respect others opinion, they get into some kind of open communication with each other, they show empathy to each other and they also suspend any kind of judgment, wherein a person starts feeling that you know he is not being judged on coming up with the ideas, then only you can bring in a lot of ideas on the table, otherwise a person would be always refraining from coming up with the ideas, 
uh, as and when they come because he starts thinking, he or she starts thinking that uh, the idea would not be taken care of in a positive manner, it would not be taken in a positive note. So, it is important for us to actively listen to each other, it is very important for us to show some kind of empathy towards each other. So, we can definitely have many such trainings in the organization, so that uh, you know uh, the psychological safety of the individuals can be improved. So, there is a term called a psychological contract also. So, uh, with the passage of time we have seen, it has been seen by many of the organizations that psychological contract, which would mean the kind of unsaid contract uh, that organization and employee or employer and employee get into when they enter into the organization. So, such kind of psychological contract is weakening with time because of the diverse needs of people and uh, when there is no alignment between the needs of people then certainly the, the kind of uh, the contract which people get into in a said or unsaid way that weakens. So, we need we always need to create a culture to uh, you know to strengthen the psychological contract which people are getting into. Because if we are successful in creating that good social bond among people, a good psychological contract among people, then eventually it will lead to increased productivity, increased effectiveness and also it will help us in evoking the good citizenship behavior among the organizational individuals. Now, what is the citizenship behavior? Uh, there is a term called as organizational citizenship behavior. It is a kind of behavior in which an individual tries to go beyond the call of duty. So, this is a kind of behavior in which an individual goes beyond the call of duty, which would mean that he would not just be performing his task assigned to him, but also would be ready to go beyond the call of duty and he would go extra mile to do what he has been assigned. Right. So, how does this uh, OCB come? Where does it come from? It comes from, you know, a good psychological safety within the organization. It comes when you are creating, uh, you know, good ground for people to operate in, when you are uh, creating a level uh, playing field for the individuals to operate in, right. So, and how can you cultivate this kind of culture within the organization? I mean, uh, fostering an inclusive training environment is very, very important and some such kind of trainings may be given in context of uh, the organization, wherein we may uh, try to put in some deliberate effort uh, to boost the element of altruism, conscientiousness, then sportsmen, ship, spirit, then element of courtesy and civic virtues. So, all these things are important constituent, uh, constituents of OCB and uh, this can OCB is organizational citizenship behavior and this can very well be implemented in the organization if we are making the people deliberately get into some such kind of exercises in such, such kind of training sessions, wherein the element of altruism, conscientiousness, civic virtues, uh, courtesy, sportsmanships, they are all boosted to a large extent. There is about promoting respect and empathy. So, respect and empathy are central to fostering an inclusive training environment where participants feel heard, they feel valued, they feel understood also. So, facilitators should model respectful communication and demonstrate empathy towards diverse perspectives and experiences. We should emphasize the importance of recognizing and appreciating the unique contribution and perspective of each individual. So, uh, some kind of uh, you know sessions wherein uh, the per, some kind of exercises pertaining to out of the box thinking of the individual should also be encouraged within the organization and we should always try to create a culture when people think a little uh, outside the box and they start promoting each other and they also have that element of empathy and there can be several exercises, training exercises which can be taken up to increase the element of empathy. And in such cases, more of team development exercises, the team building exercises, the team based exercises, the group exercises should be done. Then it is about facilitating inclusive 
discussions. Many of the organizations have this idea of uh, town hall meetings right in the beginning of the uh, day itself or maybe once a week they conduct some such kind of meetings. And uh, the idea behind conducted meetings at frequent intervals is that people come together, they interact with each other and some of the important agendas are also discussed. Similarly, we should have some room for facilitating interactive discussions also. So, when it comes to interactive discussions, you need to create opportunities for inclusive discussions where all the participants from various uh, domains, from various uh, segments, from various diverse backgrounds come together and they have a chance to contribute and engage actively. Use inclusive language and uh, we have to be very, very particular about this thing. I will just let you know about what this inclusive language is. For example, uh, some gender neutral words should be used instead of uh, uh, the uh, gender specific words, especially for example, uh, these days instead of using chairman, we say chairperson. Similarly, uh, for any other thing wherein uh, the word man used to be used, we instead use the word uh, person, right, to create this kind of inclusivity then we should avoid the jargon or terminology that may alienate or exclude certain groups. So, so we should try to encourage participants to share their expectations, their experiences, their uh, insights and question openly. We have to be very, very mindful of power dynamics and ensure that all the voices, especially those from under representative or marginalized group who in general refrain to speak up for their rights who generally uh, do not voice their opinions are given equal opportunity, equal consideration and equal respect. So, facilitating constructive dialogue by asking open ended questions from people and getting into uh, some kind of discussions with the people, promoting the idea of active listening within the organization and encouraging diverse perspectives can really serve the purpose. And when giving uh, this kind of uh, thing to the individuals, when uh, creating a foster, uh, creating and fostering an inclusive uh, training environment for the people, it is very important for us to give them some kind of, uh, you know, training on interpersonal skills also. Like for example, there is an element of, you know, transaction analysis. So, transaction analysis, uh, it is a kind of analysis in which uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, input and output is uh, analyzed or say when some kind of social interaction happens, there is some stimuli or response which happens. So, this is basically an analysis of the stimuli and response. Uh, there are, for, you know, there are many uh, constituents of it. There are many things which are related to it and uh, we should try to give some kind of training related to transaction analysis to people. So, as to ensure that if even if the conflict happens with the organization, within the organization, they have to be healthy conflicts. I mean conflicts should happen in the organization, but they should be healthy conflict. They should not be, they should not be dysfunctional con conflicts, they should be functional conflicts, right. So, such kind of training must be given to the individuals, wherein people are encouraged to take care of the ego state of the other individual also, wherein people get into some kind of uh, positive interactions with each other and uh, some meaningful results can be drawn from the kind of um, training which is given to them. So, they should facilitate constructive dialogue by asking open ended questions, promoting active listening and encouraging the diverse practices and perspectives. So, uh, now we are going to talk about addressing the power dynamics. So, recognizing and addressing the power dynamics that may exist within the training environment such as hierarchies based on the job role, seniority, identity factors, you know, it is all about recognizing and addressing such kind of power dynamics. So, creating opportunities for all participants to participate on an equal footing regardless of their position or background. Uh, so, if an op open culture is uh, created in the organization, an open environment is created in the organization and there is no uh, big, you know, 
barrier in terms of communication with the people operating at the top level management position or the middle level management position and the bottom level management position, then certainly an equal uh, footing ground can be created for them regardless of what their position is and regardless of what their background is. So encouraging facilitators to be mindful of their own privilege and using their platform to amplify the marginalized voices is an important thing. You need to foster a culture of collaboration, mutual respect among the individuals and also collective responsibility for creating an inclusive environment and cre creating an inclusive learning environment where everyone feels valued, empowered to contribute fully towards their uh, thing. So, we may get into n number of uh, such aspects and we may get into n number of uh, such training uh, environment creating uh, programs for the individual so that they feel valued and empowered in nutshell. Then it is about providing support and resources, offering the adequate support and resources to the people to help uh, participants navigate challenging topics or discussions related to diversity and inclusion, uh, providing access to additional reading material, online resources to them and also providing them support networks you know which can be followed after taking those uh, e-learning programs or maybe some kind of online modules or online portals for further learning and reflection can really help. We can, we can offer the opportunities for follow up discussions or uh, coaching sessions to address any kind of lingering questions or concerns because uh, when the training is imparted to the people maybe the, the kind of uh, takeaways of the training or the transfer of learning of training does not happen in the same fashion to all the individuals. Maybe there are some groups uh, which are not able to assimilate what, uh, what was taught to them and may be a little hesitant also in asking those things. So, some kind of support groups can be created for them and uh, they may uh, resolve all their doubts and queries related to particular topics and otherwise also. So, there is some kind of concept related to friendorship which is given way to these days which I mentioned in the last class also which is about creating an environment of friendship, then mentorship and leadership in the organization. So, if you have this concept of friendor in the organization because everybody looks out for a friend, a good mentor and also a good leader. So, if you have uh, you know all these three things in place in the organization definitely an inclusive learning environment can happen and uh, people will be more productive because their concerns, their issues, their voice everything can be very well taken care of. Now, uh, the next topic that we are going to discuss is about types of diversity training in the workplace. So, when we talk about diversity training in the workplace. The first thing is about uh, managing unconscious bias. You know, diversity training may uh, in diversity training, the first uh, you know the first kind of uh, thing which needs to be addressed is unconscious bias. Now, what is this unconscious bias? Unconscious bias training addresses deeply ingrained belief individuals may hold about social stereotypes. So, we all have some perceived notions and we all hold some kind of stereotypes for different people belonging to different groups. So, often without conscious awareness, maybe they are not even consciously aware of the fact that they have certain biases and they have certain stereotypes towards some groups or the other. So, many individuals remain uh, unaware of their personal biases and uh, may inadvertently you know uh, rely on them to form quick judgment about others. So, they are all unconscious in nature, uh, left unchecked unconscious bias can engender significant harm. It can engender significant harm particularly in a professional setting. So, all these biases have to be removed. So, effective training has to be given in this area so as to help the employees recognize their biases and equip them with strategies to mitigate these biases and to mitigate their impact. Otherwise, it can have a very, very counter counterproductive impact on the organization as, as a whole and this will certainly uh, lead to some kind of issues in the organization. 
Then is about uh, the second kind of micro, you know, uh, diversity training that can happen in the organization can be related to microaggression. So, microaggression training, you know, microaggression is about subtle insights or insults. They can be intentional or they can even be unintentional. They can convey hostile, derogatory or negative messages related to individuals race, gender, age, sexual orientation and other characteristics. For the individual who is showing this microaggression, it might be a way of life. I mean he may not be doing it very very consciously and he may not be doing it very deliberately rather. But then to the one, to the one who is uh, you know to the party uh, who is an aggrieved party or say the, the party who feels that he is uh, being bullied because of it, it can really hamper the work. So, microaggression training is designed to equip the employees with the necessary skills to identify and address such biases very, very sensitively and effectively, fostering a more inclusive and respectful workplace environment. So, this way a lot of biases can be removed if we, if we address these issues very carefully. Then is cultural competency training. So, we need to establish a workplace environment which is both diverse and inclusive. So, we need to accommodate diversity, but at the same time we need to create a very inclusive environment, so that everyone feel va feels valued and uh, you know if we are trying to create such kind of environment, it presents a lot of challenges also, it comes with its own sets of challenges also. So, cultural competency training among employees by means of incorporating such kind of trainings organization can facilitate more comfortable interactions among diverse individuals irrespective of differences in faith, race, gender, socioeconomic status or gender identity. The overarching objective is to enhance the collaboration among the staff members while dismantling barriers to inclusivity. So, this is about cultural competency training. Then we have another set of uh, diversity training that can happen in the organizations, it is religious sensitivity training. Today we have very very diverse uh, world and in today's diverse world, employees may adhere to various religious beliefs, yet hesitate to discuss them openly with their employer. Consequently, providing training on certain religious sensitivity is essential to foster an inclusive workplace environment. So, such training enables employees to navigate this sensitive terrain respectfully and also a force, you know a culture can be fostered wherein a lot of accommodation is there, a lot of understanding is there for diverse religious practices and beliefs. I have mentioned the source of uh, this, it has been taken from uh, this source. So, basically uh, this was about the types of diversity training. Before uh, moving further, I would just like to highlight on certain things which are about addressing the diversity and inclusion. So, when we are addressing the diversity and inclusion, there are few steps that we have to take care of. Number one, assessment which would mean evaluating the current state of diversity and inclusion within the organization community and this could inc include a lot of surveys. interviews and also some kind of data analysis, so that we can get a lot of data driven insights and uh, which will further help us in taking some data driven decisions. Then it is about education, so providing necessary training and education on certain aspects such as diversity, inclusion, equity uh, like topics to raise the awareness. So, education must be there to sensitize people on certain aspects of diversity, equity and inclusion to raise awareness and understanding among the various members. Then the third uh, thing could be policy reviews. So, we need to review and update policies to ensure they, that they promote diversity and inclusion, wherein uh, we are including this diversity and inclusion in nearly everything, right from hiring, manpower planning, you know, hiring, 
the individuals, recruitment of the individuals, promotions, transfers, retention practices, etc. Then after that, we need to promote an inclusive culture where all the feel, all the people feel valued and respected, and there has to be representation. So the next step is representation, ensuring diverse representation in leadership position, decision making processes would also help because uh, people will be a little unhesitant then to come up with their ideas, views, opinions, etc. And definitely this will help us in establishing support system for various uh, groups working in the organization and uh, definitely we can uh, prove to be a little productive for the organization, very highly productive for the organization rather. With this, uh, we come to the end of it. I would just like to summarize whatever we have done so far. So, in today's uh, session, we primarily talked about uh, diversity and inclusion. We discussed several aspects of diversity and inclusion and we typically talked about uh, how to de design and implement the diverse and inclusive uh, work culture and also diverse and inclusive training environment for people so that they can open up. And we also talked about fostering an inclusive training environment for people. Uh, I hope by now you have a fair understanding of the diversity and inclusion and its importance. Thank you so much.